But anyway, the, the spy robot is a, uh, it's supposed to be in the museum now, by the way. That's the other side of the fixation with technology and the, and the dependence on it to get things done is that uh, it costs a lot of money. And uh, I ran out of money. And I got, I almost got everything done about a month and a half ago, but I had to stop and unfortunately start working again because I got to, you got to pay the mortgage and you got to pay the shop rent. And so that's uh, the unfortunate side is it's very expensive. There's a lot of overhead and there's no income from SRL. But this is what uh, I hope to get installed very shortly here in the museum. The spine robot, uh, which you saw in the in the picture here, is a bunch of segments just like the spine in your back and is connected by four tendons and the tendons are made of this rope here this rope is made by a contractor for the uh, military that's owned partly by the military and it's plastic but that rope is rated for 24,000 pounds of breaking strength which is a lot so it's a very durable rope it was invented about two years ago and it is now available to civilians. And so there's a few people using it in robotics for uh, tendons. Uh, so for, for the show at the museum, I mean, you know, that, that, that's, that's how the spine robot got off the ground. I mean, this is how these machines get made. I usually make uh, one or two a year. And the two, pro, the two projects the last year and a half or so were that, uh, getting that industrial robot going and getting the spine robot going. I started working on the spine robot a year and a half ago. And so it got done for that show, but you know, again, it's a, it's a process. These machines, all these machines that you see, we probably have, there's 10 or 15 machines, they all go through a process where you get a great idea, you think, oh, that'll be easy to do, and then it just takes forever to get these things done. And then the first time you bring them out, they kind of work, and you know, they work usually, 90, I think nine times out of 10, they work enough where no one could know the difference, unless you were an engineer. And those people, what do they qualify for? <laughs> I've already gone over that. But anyway, uh, you know what I think of them. I love them. Some of my best friends are engineers. But, uh, but so, uh, you know, there's always a development process that you go through with these things. And sometimes it's a very long development process. And this was pretty, con this was pretty convoluted, but also fairly compressed. So uh, what we had to do was for the actuation of that, to, to pull the cables left and right to make it go left and right and up and down, uh, I used an older mechanism from another machine. We adapted it in a couple of days because I was like, I'm never going to get this thing done in time for the show, but we really want to get it done. So it broke, you know, damaged the machine a little bit. There were some technical issues with that that had to be solved. I mean, that's the thing is you've got these arty machines and it's really easy to make a machine that doesn't have a lot of energy required to power it. But once you start getting into like 5 or 10 kilowatts of energy to move something around, things break. So you have to design them very differently than things that have like little electric motors on them and stuff like that. You really have to deal with like some, you have to really do some mechanical engineering to make it happen. And so in this case, uh, the performance <coughs> Was the, was the torture test. That was our first rollout of the machine. It was running the night before the show. And so from that test, I learned a few things. One of which was that the holes in here, which is where the cable goes through, were too small. And so that was creating a problem for the rope being able to move freely. Imagine your tendons just being stuck inside your hand and you're trying to move your fingers down. And like you have to use all your energy just to get your fingers to move like this. Well, that's not going to work. After a while, you're going to they're going to cut your hand off like they did me. And uh, so that had to be changed. So all those had to be the diameter had to be changed. And then uh, the other problem was that that actuator was pulling with rubber bands on two sides. So that was adding four thousand pounds of force, two thousand pounds on each axis pulling the thing together, which caused scoliosis, which is like when your spine twists into a knot. Like what would happen is when you move that hand one way, it would kind of untwist, and when you moved it the other way, the, I mean the spine rubber would twist the other way, but it was so tightened up in there that it was twisting up. So, simple problem, 
simple, so simple solution. <laughs> this is the simple solution to that problem. Uh, this is called a push-pull winch. You almost never see them anywhere. And the reason is because it's very hard to make them. And so what it, how they work is you've got, a, you've got a, a spool here, a winch spool here, and you've got a winch spool here. This one controls the vertical. This one controls the horizontal, just like in the twilight zone. And uh, so you, you've got your ropes. Your ropes, pretend this is a rope. So your rope's coming through here. It's going down here to another spool. And then this goes up and down. And down in here you have a piece of urethane, which is the spring. So that gives you what's called compliance, because if you have two arcs that are offset from each other, the length of one arc is slightly different than the length of the other arc. In fact, it's one inch different in length. So you have to have what's called compliance. And this is where the compliance is right here. So the maximum amount of spring energy that's on that now is the sum of both of those pieces of urethane, which is a spring, basically. They just call it. It's, it's what they use for springs. They don't use metal anymore. They use springs, uh, rubber springs, urethane. So the maximum amount now is 600 pounds. So there's 600 pounds of compressive force as opposed to 4,000. So that solves that problem. And then the other thing is you've got a balanced push-pull. One side is coming through there and going around here to the left. And the other side, and it's unwinding from the bottom. The other side unwinds from the top, and it just goes straight through to here. And so because they're basically connected at the end, when one side unwinds, the other side winds and vice versa. They're very clever, but it's a very tricky thing to get them to work correctly. And you got the same thing up here. And so that's, it, you know, this is, and, that, and then this is attached to, there's a, there's a, there's a cutaway here, and that's because there's a big sprocket that goes on there, and there's a hydraulic motor that goes under here. Operating the whole thing, again, the sole swords to plowshares. Yes. Right? A lot of this stuff, like this stuff here, this is armor from a Bradley fighting vehicle. You will never, ever see this aluminum anywhere, and I shouldn't have ever had it. But I got it from BAE, and they weren't supposed to sell it to me, but they love SRL at BAE, the people that make the army tanks, so they sold me a big stack of it. And they said, don't ever resell this stuff. But it's a very special kind of aluminum that is used in composite armor. So there's that. And then the actual actuator from it is another, it's, it's from a Bradley fighting field that was outfitted with a bomb removal system, which is a long crane that goes and, and picks up things on the side of the road that look like bombs. And you've got a radio controlled uh, uh, actuator, a little radio controlled box that sits on your tummy and you can control it from a distance so you can be picking up the rags or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but apparently this one got the arm blown up because it came, they, someone took the hydraulic system back and brought it back. And so that's what's going to be actually operating the machine itself. That's what supplies the, the motive force. That's like a five kilowatt uh, hydraulic system. That's, this is an example of the kind of stuff that gets built at SRL, which is like if you had to charge for this, you know, it would probably, you know, probably like ten or $20,000 to make these things. I mean, there's, there, in fact, there's one other, I have one competitor in the spine robot business, Festo. <laughs> Festo, which is a multi-billion dollar company in Europe, they released their spine robot video in November. I was outraged <laughs> because uh, Festo cost $200,000. I mean, it was total high production HD video, it's super fancy. And they must have spent millions and millions on the development of this robot, but it's like, and their whole thing is like it's all user friendly and it's a, it's a pneumatic robot because that's what Festo does. But it looks just the same. It's like, got a, it's like a little kind of Robbie the robot looking arm that kind of snorkels around. It's meant to be handling things around invalids and stuff. But they edited, you, the, you can see from the way they edited the video, they're having some problems with theirs too. <laughs> I, uh, I don't, I can't, uh, I think it's going to take a little while until they get it uh, get it going on. So you want to, I mean, aside from the shows, every now and then we'll do some kind of practical joke, kind of fun stuff like that. But again, it's just uh, you know, it's just 
It's having fun. And that's a subjugator, Kristen's machine. Well, you just said, oh, you're just saying, out of here, don't ever come back in the mission ever again. He didn't want to file a report yeah, on it. Yeah, he took no, he took the spark plug wires away. He goes, how do I keep, <laughs> how do I stop this thing from working? And I said, well, the spark plug wires. And so he took the spark plug like, wires oh, away. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's part of the reason that we were able to prosper and grow. It was in San Francisco, there's a very <coughs> tolerant attitude towards the arts. Mm -hmm. And the police there always could tell the difference between someone just screwing around mm -hmm. and someone really doing something that was not in the interest of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a show we did in Austria in a giant toilet paper factory. Oh <laughs> And uh, a little monkey machine of some kind. <laughs> this show also had some kind of strange repercussions because it was so loud. And uh, <laughs> it was called The Deliberate Evolution of a War Zone. And there had been recently a war in Bukovar, which was about 30 miles away, where the Serbs were attacking the Croats. And so uh, they, they were a little, it was a little dicey there. And so we called it that, we were running the V1 in there and stuff like that, and a couple hundred people just got scared because of the noise. Kevin Binker had had this crazy machine spinning a steel cable with a 400 horsepower V8 that was making a lot of noise and sounded like a squadron of airplanes. People panicked, the public <clears throat> panicked, and they called up the police. The police said, oh, it's an art show, and no one believed them. So then they called up the Ministry of Defense and they put the forces on a national alert. Oh, God. So the next day in the newspaper, all the right-wing newspapers were going crazy, like, these Americans coming here, ruining our country, ridiculing us. And so it turned into this real political football where the, uh, where, you know, the promoters really got into a lot of trouble. And we were just screwing around, you know, I mean, we were just doing what we were supposed to do, you know. But uh, in the museum, you can see you got off easy. We were really, we didn't have that much time. That's the problem. That was the problem. If we had a little more time, we could have done more stuff. But. <laughs>